Hello and welcome. I'm Tom Palmer. With me is Dr. James Fadiman, and tonight we're speaking about the psychedelic experience. Thank you for coming, Dr. Fadiman. It's my pleasure. I'm very glad to have you. So um, you wrote a book called uh, the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Safe, therapeutic, and sacred journeys. Yes. And what motivated you to write that book? Well, I realized at some point I was starting to do a memoir about all the interesting people I'd ever known and all the people I'd used drugs with and so forth and so on and then I realized that nobody cared and then I thought do I know anything that other people don't know and I realized that I'd, I had actually done psychedelic research in pretty much all four major areas and that no one else who's still around at least had ever done that and so I actually knew things that people needed to know if they're going to use these materials legally or not, they should do it safely. And there's also ways of using them that most people really are unaware of. And so that's how the book came out. And uh, a bit about your background. You were one of the last uh, LSD researchers, or you were researching in the 60s when they made it illegal. Yeah. Uh, LSD was legal. And when I was a graduate student at Stanford, I was also working with a group in Menlo Park called the International Foundation for Advanced Study if as, <laughs> not to be confused with the one in uh, Harvard, which was known as if if. <laughs> and we had permission from the government to work with people therapeutically. And we were using high doses for people that understand about LSD, that was like 400 micrograms. And we were giving them uh, what about 80% of them said was the most valuable experience of their life. And so that's what we were allowed to do. And then we moved to working with scientists on scientific problem solving, which is a whole other area. And during those studies, the government shut us down and every other research project in the country. So that was, uh, that was my start. So everybody got the letters at the same time. Everyone got a letter from the government that said, as the receipt of this letter, your research is canceled. Your investigational drug license, so to speak, has just been pulled. And at that point, we had four senior scientists in our little living room setup, um, lying down with headphones, and we were about to get them up and give them the chance to work on their problems they'd brought in that had been obsessing them for months. Here was this letter, here were the scientists. And I said to the group, I was kind of the youngest member, I said, I think we got this letter tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and we got it the next day right. <laughs> and worked with those four guys and uh, uh, that's when that research ended. What percentage of those people had breakthroughs in their thinking? It was well below 90%, like 88%. <laughs> we had, out of that group, we had patents, we had uh, publications, we had products. And the reason we picked hard scientific problems is then we didn't have to evaluate it, we didn't have to do psychological tests, we didn't have to have judges. Uh, we simply said to the people, uh, was this valuable? And one of the ways we knew it was valuable is very often we'd have one member of a, of a working team, say at Hewlett Packard or at Varian or at Stanford Research Institute, and the next week we'd get calls and said, we're working with this guy, we'd like to be uh, subjects in the research as well because he came back with real improvements in what we're doing. And that was incredibly exciting um, to be giving people the chance to use the analytic part of their minds, not the psychotherapeutic and the spiritual, which we'd also worked with, but just the part that makes a difference in the material world by inventing things. And that was terrific. And not all that well known, but there are two Nobel Prize scientists who have acknowledged um, LSD use as pivotal for what they got their Nobel Prizes for. So this material was a lot more useful than the government has ever admitted. Now Francis Crick was one of those two. Francis Crick had visualized a single helix kind of all by himself, but according to Francis, with 100 micrograms of LSD or something like that, a double helix, wow. And the other is Gary Mullis, Kerry Mullis, um, who basically said, I didn't use LSD when I made the discovery for which I got the Nobel Prize, 
But by that time, I had learned by my use of LSD how to get inside molecules and look around. So um, I suspect there's some other Nobel Prize winners out there who are not talking. Well, Francis Crick didn't want it known until after his death. Right, right. It was oh. a, but the group that he was with in England, they were among, as graduate students will do, um, they were using LSD, uh, recreationally primarily, but you can't have really, really smart guys using something like this without their saying, I wonder how this works on the smart part of my mind. Dr. Fadman, what do you think it is about the psychedelic experience that opens up these um, avenues of exploration? Well, for the past 40 years, I have a very correct answer, which is I'm the faintest idea. But this year, and there's a study in England where they took psilocybin and they basically injected it into people. And when, it, when you use it that way, it has about a 15 minute, a very intense high. And during that 15 minutes, they were monitoring cerebral blood flow, meaning what parts of the brain are getting nourished, what parts of the brain are getting less nourished. And we always thought that what happened is the parts dealing with sensory awareness and sensuality and things like that would get this explosion of extra um, energy. Turns out we were totally wrong. What happens is the parts of the brain that are most interested in personal identity and limitations get undernourished. So the natural amount of information that's always ricocheting around the brain is actually experienced. And what's fascinating is people experience this blissfully, even though their personality at that point is at a minimum. So it reduces the ego. It seems to get the ego out of the way, just like every spiritual system we've ever heard of says is necessary. Yes. And then the boundaries just go away. And well, when the boundaries go away, then the question is how far out do you extend? And right. the answer is that you are clearly connected to everything. Um, just obviously I'm connected to this chair, the chair is connected to the floor, the floor is connected to the studio, to the street, to Berkeley, and so forth. That's obvious intellectually, even though we don't think that way. But if you can feel and sense that, that you're actually part of this huge matrix, then you have different capacities to, to think and feel within that, that larger matrix. So Aldous, Aldous Huxley put it as a reducing valve. You know, our minds experience this all the time, but it would be very hard to make a living in this world if you experience that all the time. Well, one of the things we know is that bliss is not a steady state. And that if you're in a state of, of ecstatic bliss and awareness and feeling wonderful about everything, there's not a lot of ambition in that state uh, because everything's fine. In fact, when you then look at almost everything, you see the beauty in it. And when you look at anything, you can see that it is actually obviously alive. I mean, we, again, we know intellectually that my hand is 99.99% .99 empty space. But the air is a little more empty space, so I can put this through this and it works pretty well. But if I'm seeing them all as energy, um, that's a very different sensation. It's a very different realization. And once you have those realizations, um, you retain the, the knowledge of the realization, just as when you've been to, say, Niagara Falls. Um, it's really big, it's really loud, it's really wet, it's really exciting. And then when you're back in Duluth or Argentina, um, someone says Niagara Falls, and you have a different feeling because you have experience of what that means, rather than it's a postcard with this kind of lot of water in the, in the postcard. Are there ways that you can stabilize the experience and integrate it into your everyday life? Better? Well, it's one of the things that, that it's harder to do when, when the substances are illegal, which is integration is necessary because these are profound uh, moments for people. And when I said earlier that the people we worked with, literally 80% of them said this was the single most important experience of their life. Well, we didn't just give it to them in the morning and wish them well at five o'clock. They had had some weeks of preparation and they had some weeks of integration. Because to integrate that into your life is not easy, especially when you're in a culture that doesn't quite know what you're talking about. And so one of the things people learned to do was not to share with people who 
try to belittle their experience. We also advised them not to make any life changes for a few weeks. And we did that because some guy left us on a Friday and came back married on a Monday. And we congratulated him and he said, well, I met her Friday night. And so we, we asked people just not to change their jobs and not to change their relationships for about six weeks while integration happened. And, and that turned out to be very good advice. So when these substances became illegal, um, how did your focus change? What have you been doing since then? Well, I, for whatever reasons, I'm moderately law abiding. And so I looked around and I saw that the, that which was most interesting to me was not available. But all the effects of what was interesting to me was, which were what were the great spiritual traditions, what, were, what did we know in psychology, what did we know about uh, energy and about healing and about medicine. And so I ended up really involved in holistic health. I ended up uh, establishing with a number of other people a whole branch of psychology which included the spiritual called the transpersonal. I set up a graduate school with a friend, Robert Frager, which was called the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology. It was a, a PhD granting institution. And now 35 years later, it's just become Sophia University. Um, we have uh, organizations around the world that have made use of, of this training. So I basically tried to do with what I understood whatever the culture could tolerate. And now that psychedelics are back being researched, what I'm finding is, is the culture can tolerate people like me being on programs like this, talking about what's the best way to use a substance which for fairly bizarre political reasons is illegal. And, and I should mention, because I'm, I'm not really interested in people taking these substances, but that's a little bit like some sex educator saying, well, I'm not interested in people having sex. The sex educator knows that people are going to have sex. The problem is, are they going to do it correctly? And since the government made psychedelics illegal, in the United States alone, 23 million people have taken LSD since it was illegal, since it, quote, had no possible uses, and since it was unobtainable. And what's more interesting to me is four to 600,000 people will take it for the first time this year. And I'd like those people to do it safely and well. So that's part of my kind of missionary zeal. So a lot of those people will be taking it as a party drug. They'll be drinking at the same time. Um, what should they be doing? Well, what they should be doing is not drinking at the same time for openers. Um, and what they should be doing if they're going to use it is, is probably to, to learn a little bit. Um, unfortunately, as a, as a plug, I, I have several chapters of the book which basically says, what's the best way you can take it that we've ever found? And, how does, and it turns out what we discovered in the 60s was pretty much what the indigenous people have evolved over several thousand years, which is you take it with a guide, with someone who knows so much more than you do. So if you do get frightened, because this is new territory, uh, there's somebody there that says, hey, that's all right, or uh, move a little to the right, uh, or take a deep breath, or it's really fine what you're doing. Other people have done this. It's only a drug, and don't worry. And all those things change enormously people's experience. It's the difference between getting an injection in a physician's office with your arm relaxed and a nurse kind of looking nice at you and somebody running up on the street with a syringe and stecking you. It's both are injection into the arm of something, but whoa, the difference of being with people who know what they're doing is huge. So set setting. Set, which is what do you intend to get out of it? And if it's recreational, hopefully you're taking a low enough dose so you won't get in trouble. But if you're seriously looking at, at understanding yourself more, which is a higher dose, or understanding the spiritual dimensions of the universe, which is a higher dose, then you probably would do much better with somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, we have something called a designated driver. That's somebody who says, I actually can get us home. Don't worry. And being, the design, being a designated driver is a very honorable profession. And um, it's wonderful because I'm like a right-wing fanatic uh, about guiding. And here I am in this wonderful progressive left-wing area, the culture of psychedelics, 
kind of saying, over here. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it right. Right. Should you start with a low dose if you're new to it? Well, I don't know because I don't know anymore even what a dose is. Um, but it really, again, depends on more of what your intention is and what your situation is. Because set, word you use, and I use it all the time, is kind of mental attitude. Setting is what's the ambiance, what's the atmosphere, what's the situation? Um, are you hanging on to someone on the back of a motorcycle? Not a good idea. Are you um, in a national park near a waterfall? Better. Are you with people? several of whom really know their way around, and perhaps someone is, has given you music to listen to and is there just to be for you, better yet. So the question of dose is another question, and obviously taking more both increases the possibilities, but it also increases the risk. And above a certain amount, it's simply what people say, well, oh, you should try a whole lot, kind of macho. And the answer is, well, if you try a whole lot, two things are wrong. One is you won't remember anything, meaning you won't bring anything back. And two is you're wasting a lot of really good material. It's kind of like saying, this is really expensive scotch. I'm going to pour it on my head. Well, Terence McKenna used to uh, talk about heroic doses and big doses. Yeah, and I, he, he I liked really to slam the system, bring it back to equilibrium, let it stay in equilibrium, and then slam it again in a month or two. Or well, my suggestion is if you're Terrence McKenna, you should do that. But I've never met anyone else who has actually said this, quote, heroic dose was a good idea. Most people get that when you do too much of something, but much of anything, it's too much. You know, if I like ice cream, and I think if I like ice cream, why wouldn't two gallons be even better than three scoops? And the answer is because on three scoops you don't get sick. And on two gallons you think I'm never going to have ice cream again. So heroic dose is probably one of the things that I am trying very hard to get out of people's vocabulary. The other thing I want out of people's vocabulary is quite different. It's called a bad trip. And what I've found, and I've been interviewing now hundreds of students, because students are the people who both know the most and have taken unbelievably amounts of interesting drugs these days, is I say, was it a challenging trip? And the answer is, oh, yeah. Meaning it had very difficult portions, and it wasn't pleasant, and it may have made you feel terrible for a while after, but as you began to integrate it, you began to see that there was something important for you there. So my feeling is always, if you're going to use these things, go for the safest, most beneficial, kindest, most expansive experience, but if things are hard, then deal with that as well as you can. And the best people actually at Burning Man. Burning Man has all kinds of wonderfully trained people because all kinds of bizarre things happen at Burning Man, but what they say is we never bring anyone down. We bring them through. And I've seen again and again people in terribly terrified places totally not knowing what happened to them. Maybe their date slipped it to them, maybe they took five times as much as they should have, and they end up in this little sanctuary with these wonderful people. And at, within a few hours they say, oh, oh, it's okay. Oh, I can see what happened. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really learning from this. Thank you so much. So even very, very difficult trips or journeys can be turned around, again, with a skilled guide. It seems that if you're able to meet the experience, it's better. If you, if you try to run from it, it's going to be hard. Well, as, as the way you're supposed to deal with, you know, when you meet the bear or the tiger or the lion uh, or the wolf, you're supposed to kind of say, the one thing that should go through your mind is don't look like prey. Right. And in a sense, when you have a difficult internal situation, as you do in your life, you know, when you're in an argument with someone you love, and you're just about to say something really hurtful. And that inner voice says, how about a little self-control? You're, you're, you're furious right now, but you really love this person. Do you really want this forever in your system? And so in a little bit, when you're having a difficult experience with a psychedelic, as you do in a difficult experience in life, if you can pull yourself back, you can say, okay, it's a difficult experience. I'll do the best I can. 
and that really helps. Dr. Fadiman, um, could these um, could psychedelics have use for people who have had traumatic experiences, uh, returning veterans, things like that? Well, there's psychedelics which are kind of uh, there are various technical ways of describing them. There's also ecstasy, and ecstasy is like a kind of psychedelic which is you don't lose track of your personality, you don't lose track of your identity. But what you do have is the ability to access the most disturbing feelings you've ever had and not be disturbed by reviewing them. And the, the research is impeccable, where you've taken people with post-traumatic stress disorder, bad. Yes. Meaning you can't function, you have nightmares, uh, when somebody pops a bottle top, you dive under the sofa. Um, you're basically, in a sense, prevented from having your life. And a lot of the returning soldiers who've committed suicide have it. Well, it turns out with MDMA and what's called correctly MDMA-assisted therapy, which is it's in a therapy program, but you have a couple of these experiences. Uh, in the first group, 80% of them basically um, lost so many of their symptoms, they no longer could have been admitted to the study. And a number of them simply returned to full-time work. So that's now being done again, but it's, it's being done with veterans. And think about it. There are approximately 700,000 veterans returning from these last few wars with post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, the conventional methods of treating them don't help a lot of those people. Some yes, but many not. MDMA-assisted therapy seems to be incredibly useful. And there are other places. Um, I was just reading today about a, a man who's a, actually a stuntman for his occupation, but he came down with Parkinson's. Well, Parkinson's and stuntmen just don't go together. So, and he was acutely aware of the loss of, of physical um, agility. Well, it turns out when he took MDMA, and he did this uh, in a scientific uh, laboratory, that for the number of hours the drug was working, he had a, a large return of his capacity. He certainly wasn't uh, as good as he'd ever been, but he could do like somersaults and things. And then as the drug wore off, um, he still had Parkinson's, it was not a cure. And that we're just exploring. So that's a, that's a really new one. And um, again, why should people with Parkinson's, with post-traumatic stress disorder, be denied a medication which seems to help them? So would you agree that people need to speak up and, and make some noise for their rights? Uh, people aren't granted rights without uh in this country or any most countries well standing up for let, what they let's want. Let's go deeper than rights, which is what are the basic freedoms? And I don't think there's an argument. I've been on some wonderful right-wing programs and I start with what are basic freedoms and I say is it should be should you be allowed to get closer to divinity? Okay? All the right-wing shows say well, yeah, that's that's cool. <laughs> and I say and should you be allowed to understand the natural world? Should you be allowed to do science? Should you be allowed to discover and create? Yeah. And should you be allowed to explore yourself and know your own soul? Sure. And I say, well, turns out psychedelics are an incredibly useful tool in those three areas. They allow you to get closer to divinity. They allow you to understand yourself and to actually alleviate a lot of what we would call kind of garden neuroses. Um, and they allow you, particularly as we did with crick and problem solving, to really explore the natural world with an advanced tool. So in some sense, when people say, you shouldn't use these because the government put them on a schedule, I guess my answer is if they put a microscope on the schedule, would you assume that it uh, had suddenly turned into a bad instrument? So yeah, uh, those who make no effort to retain their rights in historically, don't keep them too long. Is there an organized movement like the legalized marijuana movement? No, there's actually an incredibly disorganized <laughs> movement. Yeah. Uh, when I say 23 million people, what's lovely is when you write a book about psychedelics, when you write any book, you kind of go around and total strangers kind of get book in the face. 
And what I do, since I do that to people, <laughs> the number of people who respond and say, hey man, or I did that in college. I mean, you, you sit next to someone on a plane who you know must be a hedge fund manager who is, who is screwing some small country um, by selling them bonds that are worthless. And you put your little book up and he looks at you like you are scum. And then there's this funny thing that happens, which is this, this little kind of, oh. And he says, you know, in college once, I took, uh, I think it was psilocybin, it was mushrooms. And I remember I was running down the street about four in the morning, I was naked. And I was yelling, what are you all doing up there hiding in your clothes? <laughs> and then you kind of watch it, you know, kind of the shape shift again. And there's the guy looking at you and you, you don't say anything. You just say, would you like a copy of this book? To which very often the answer is, you're, you're giving it to me? <laughs> I said, for you, I'm giving it to you. For you. So you're trying to put it out there. It's a meme. It's a good meme. Uh, you know, hopefully the culture will pick it up, right? Well, it's a return to a lot of the memes that the 60s attempted. But the 60s, which were predominantly, after all, the beginning of the college, movement, the beginning of women's liberation, civil rights, etc. Um, but, but was done by very young people without power. And what's true now is that those young people who had those experiences are now, they're the judges, uh, they're the, the DAs, they're the, the people in Drug Enforcement Administration, they're the cops. So that the young people now who are taking charge um, are getting a lot more support than our generation did. And that is an extremely positive part of what we're doing. Well, Dr. Fadman, we have about three more minutes and there's so much I'd like to talk to you about. Um, one thing that had occurred to me to mention was the distinction between a psychotropic, a naturally occurring plant, uh, psilocybin plants like uh, the mushroom, or say uh, peyote cactus, uh, versus LSD, which is made in a laboratory. Yeah, um, is there a useful distinction between them? Well, not much. Um, I remember one of the health food books saying that the molecule of vitamin C, when it gets into your cell, doesn't know whether it was made in a laboratory or an orange. And so the question is, what does the molecule do? And the answer is synthetics and plants um, have much of the same effects. The difference is the plant has all kinds of other fascinating things that we haven't explored. Peyote, for example, has mescaline. We know about that. But it has 43 other alkaloids. And nature put them there for some purpose. And we're just beginning to be able to handle that complicated a, a kind of biological and, and pharmacological question. Could it be that a, um, a few alkaloids here and there, or tertiary alkaloids, could change the experience and are, in impor fact, important? Well, probably yes. And no. the answer is, again, if you, given that peyote has no enemies, nothing ever attacks it because it's the most horrible tasting thing in the world, and it's very small and it's very ugly and it's a one inch above the ground, why does it have 43 alkaloids? Several of which seem to lock into receptors in the human brain. So if you ask the shamans, they say, well, the, some of the plants understand they have an obligation to teach us. And then you watch people who are sure that plants can't be intelligent get frightened of these shamans and think these, these guys have been taking too many plants. So we're at a funny place where the question is, who's going to be most interested in saving the planet since we're not doing a very good job? And the answer is clearly the plants. And so suddenly out of South America comes all these plants that have been used for thousands of years, very quietly, and they ayahuasca. keep saying, you know, ayahuasca being the best known, which is actually two plants. And it keeps saying, we're here to help you. We're here to make you healthier so that you will want to save not only the planet, but the plants. And that to me is the kind of next whole era of exploration. Very good. All right, Dr. James Fetterman, thank you so much for coming. The book is The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Um, very glad to have you here. Thank you very much for All the right. invitation. It's been a great pleasure. Good. And thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>